Um, very, I'm very pleased now to introduce Biz Bell. Biz is very much one of the leaders in seabird conservation in New Zealand and her influence is felt around the world as well. Um, two years ago she was awarded a Holdaway, Holdaway Award by the Hareki Gulf Forum for her contribution to conservation throughout the Hareki Gulf and we're very grateful that she's come to speak to us today. Thank you. Wow, well that's a, that's a bit of a scary introduction. Um, I'm not at all that frightening. Um, and it's amazing the follow on from a couple of students who are going to be leading the way and excitingly showing us some new results over the next few years at the next few seminars. So what I'm going to talk about is a couple of species that we've been working on with uh, myself and colleagues and with a whole heap of collaborators usually and a whole heap of uh, wonderful volunteers. Uh, as well. And so we're talking about uh, Takakitai, the black petrel, and uh, Tonui, the flesh footed shearwater work we're doing around the place now. I've been studying uh, Takakitai for 24 years. Um, this is the 24th season, back up the hill uh, in January, so that's really exciting, keeping going. So I keep telling people I'll be doing it when I'm 90 with a Zimmer frame up the top of Great Barrier. Um, and our flesh footed shearwater work, we're on year four of a five year project and we're hoping to extend that and I'm pretty sure Pat will also want to be working on that until he's 90. So yeah, he's got a few more years on it than I do. So what I'm going to talk about is just a little pocket of our work, um, focus on the recent population estimates we've done for flesh footed shearwaters and the exciting at sea tracking of chicks for, those species, for that species and basically about the at sea distribution work we're doing with black petrels. So at sea, they look pretty similar, these two birds. They're both sort of medium-sized seabirds. Um, fishermen actually get them pretty confused. They're all sort of blanketly called mutton ducks. Um, a little over a metre's wingspan. They're all dark, brownish black. And as this, the name suggests, flesh-footed shearwaters have fleshy-coloured feet um, and a fleshy-coloured bill. And black petrels are pretty much all black, except for the pale bill um, side plates. Black petrels are found only on Aotea Great Barrier Island, where the majority of the population is, about 2,000 breeding pairs. Good on you, Chris. Um, and also on Haturu, about 600 breeding pairs. So we are doing population estimate work on this species and things, but way too long a story to talk about in this, this time. And then flesh-footed shearwaters are a bit more widespread across New Zealand, uh, but mainly a northern species um, all over the place. But there are a few found down in Cook Strait, Titi Islands and things. And we have been working on them on Lady Alice and Ohino Islands. So one in the Mercury group, one out in the hen and chickens. So we're going to focus on the black petrels first. So what we've been doing, just we've been doing some GPS tracking of breeding adults. We did do some through the incubation, through the chick rearing period in March, April 2018, which we talked about last time we were here. But this time I'm going to sort of focus mainly on the work we've done in January, February in 2019, where we're looking at the parents incubating eggs. So we just deployed 46 uh, GPS, high resolution GPS devices, 30 on females and 16 on males, some of them in the same burrow. So partners. And this is basically all the trips combined and where they all went. Incubation trips varied from two days to 26 days, but the average was about 10 days. And the average distance was about just under or just over 4,000 kilometres from Great Barrier Island. So they could travel some distances within that period of time. And as you can see, they went all the way to Australia a little bit down to, Cook, uh, to Chatham Rise and further, further east there, so quite a lot, but some significant hot spots within the Gulf and along that whole wonderful IBA area, marine IBA that uh, Chris developed. So yeah, so fantastic foraging sites. But then we've also split it up to see what behaviour happens, you know, what are the stages. So that top yellow one, of course, is everything combined, that's all behaviours and all the trips combined. The green is the foraging. 
So this is where they spent their time foraging. And interestingly, of all those trips and the length of time they were away, only 15% of those trip times was spent foraging. So not very long at all. So obviously they've got to go to a spot that's really good for food if they're only spending that a little amount of time doing any feeding. The bottom left one is the red one, which is the amount of flying they did in the trips. So 56% of their time is spent flying from place to place. And the bottom right, 29% uh, of the time, the rest of it is, sleep, is, is sleeping, resting, resting on the water, sleeping on the water. So as you can see, they don't spend a lot of time feeding. So that was really interesting. And then when we had, took a closer look at the foraging, we wanted to see where those important hotspots were for, for black petrels. And there was quite a lot of them. Interestingly, half inside New Zealand's EEZ, and of course half outside New Zealand's EEZ. But a lot of our, the, the ridges are important, those um, at sea high points and things in the bathymetry, you can follow the, the Norfolk Ridge, the Hikarangi, uh, Hikarangi Plateau, Kermadec Ridge, East Cape, Bay of Plenty, all those sort of things. And interestingly, when we compared it, only three of those hotspots overlapped with the incubation time, uh, with the, sorry, with the chick rearing time. So Great Barrier Island, not really a surprise in that sea area, because that's where they come back to colony, so of course they're going to forage highly intensively in that area at both times. But also the Three Kings and the uh, Norfolk Ridge. So some interesting spots that parents went to all the time. And interestingly, we always thought black petrels were foraging at night because they eat a lot of bioluminescent squid, while well, some dive depth research suggested that they don't and most of their time is spent in the day. And this showed exactly the same thing. Basically, most of the birds are foraging between six o'clock in the morning and seven o'clock at night. So they are day feeders. But because we had some incubation period data versus chick rearing period data, we wanted to, and we tracked the same parents from the same burrows in those two seasons, we wanted to see if there was any patterns. Did they go to the same areas in incubation and chick rearing? Did they go to different areas? Did they have a better place to get better food when they're trying to feed a chick than when they're comparing feeding themselves? So we had luckily three birds that overlapped. So this is the track of a male. He's 30 years old. He was banded as a chick on Great Barrier Island in 1989 by Mike Imber. And he went pretty much to the same place when he was incubating eggs or when he was feeding his chicks. So down the East Cape and then further down the country. However, a much younger female, she's eight years old, and she was banded as a chick in our study year in 2011. Um, she did a short trip during incubation, sort of to the West Norfolk Ridge and had a pot around there and lots of feeding. But then when she was chick rearing, she went to Australia. Much longer trip. So Dad had a lot more time on the, on the nest or looking after him, or he was doing a lot shorter trips to feed the chick. So yeah, she, she went shopping. <laughs> and then another female who's approximately 12 years old because we banded her as an adult, so we don't know exactly her age and we estimate they're about five, year, five years old when we, when we uh, banned them. She did a much longer trip in incubation as well. Um, but much shorter chick provisioning tri chick, uh, chick trips, which is what we expected. Um, we expect them to do shorter trips because they've got to go and get food, bring it straight back for the chick. But um, an incubation, Dad's on the, on the nest looking after, after the egg so she can go out and get a lot more, more food, and much more high quality food for herself. So that was quite interesting. So we don't really know. Some birds do do something, some birds do the other. So we're going to hopefully find out a bit more on future tracking projects uh, to see if this sort of pattern continues. But just as an overall comparison, this is comparing the incubation um, period of tracking with all of the chick rearing tracking. And as you can see, they're pretty similar. You know, slightly shorter distances overall um, for chick rearing. Again, to be understood, you're desperate to get back to feed your chick. Slightly shorter trip length times, but again, pretty similar. Um, and slightly further distances away from, from ATF from when, you, when you're looking after an egg. So a little bit less pressure when you're sitting on an egg compared to feeding a, a hungry, grumpy chick. But the exciting thing we also did was to try and find out what was happening 
for migration. So black petrels, once they've fledged their chicks or if they've had an egg failure, they will depart and they spend their off-season time in the waters of South America. Um, and we wanted to know what directions they went and how long it took and just general patterns of that migration. So we put on lots of geolocators, so GLS devices, so a much smaller device, not quite as high resolution as a GPS, but gives it a long battery life that can last three to five years, depending on the device you do. So we deployed these in March 2018 and retrieved them the following year in February 19. So they've been on for that long. We deployed 55, 29 on males, 26 on females, and we got 46 of them back. Um, we actually recaptured another four of those birds, but the devices had fallen off, so, and a couple of birds were still waiting to get back. And hopefully this little video works. So there we go. This is what the results show. So we'll glad it took over. They go to Galapagos and Ecuador, and then on October they're coming back, and oh, they're in breeding season, and they're starting to incubate eggs and chicks. Oh, and now they're leaving New Zealand again after feeding chicks. By June, most of them are gone. Chicks fledge end of May, uh, anywhere through end of April, May. So as you can see, it's just a really interesting pattern where close to New Zealand and into Australia and into a little bit of the Pacific, but they start leaving once the nests are failing. So that was really exciting. And basically spending very, very constricted area of space over an Ecuador coast and around Galapagos in that non-breeding period. So that was pretty exciting. But then onto the fleshies. So we were doing mainly on Lady Alice, so we were trying to get an idea of the population estimate. So previous estimates had put flash footed shearwaters in a very high risk um, category, near threatened, this sort of thing. So we wanted to see if that population was increasing, decreasing, or stable. Because of course, if your population is at low numbers and you're getting impacted by fisher fishing or pollution events, it's going to make more of a problem for, the, for that species as a whole. So we did nearly 400 transects across the island, um, 13,460 4, 13, metres um, of the island were covered through 20 metre transects um, across some really terrible uh, country and horrible scrub. Um, luckily that wasn't me, uh, so that's okay. Um, sorry, in the Hen and Chicken Islands. So, yep, uh, 635 burrows were counted, and of those, nearly 600 were burrow scoped to get an idea of occupancy and things like that. And we've detected nine colonies, three of which, uh, two of which were new. And the burrow density and occupancy completely varied throughout the colony. So there was sometimes 39% burrows occupied, others 57% occupied, um, and things. But 80% of the flesh-footed shearwaters were actually found in those northern colonies. And then there was a few mixed with um, grey-faced petrels and things. And as uh, somebody, I can't remember, was saying, you know, there's, there's a lot of competition for burrows. There's five burrowing seabird species on this. Never mind about the penguins, the poor old other species also have a lot of fighting to do to get the right habitat. So, yeah, most of the birds all over the place there. But interestingly, our population estimates were massively significant than the previous estimates in 2009, which is great for flesh-footed shearwaters, and the Department of Conservation and MPI love us because the, the risk assessment went down um, because there's a lot more birds and things. But of course, uh, it's probably a bit to do with the sampling method as well. So yeah, but it, it was the same result on all of the other islands that we also surveyed. So as you can see, we've got a couple more to check up on to see if that is consistent across the whole area. So yeah, but basically the population estimates increased anywhere from 193% to 562% from that previous estimate. So maybe they're not in such a bad way as, as we hoped, or as we thought. And then of course, we did the exciting flesh footed shearwater chick tracking. And this sort of carried on from the wonderful results we got on our black petrol work. And we wanted to know if we could find some interesting things out about chicks and where flesh-footed shearwater chicks and it all sort of related to we know a bit about where adults go to and go from so there's been a lot of GLS tracking in Australia and Western Australian birds go to the Indian coast and the, the Eastern Australian birds and things from Lord Howe and things go up to towards Japan and so do most of our adults but 
there are reports of flesh footed shearwaters off the coast of America and things. And where did, where did they come from? And um, maybe they're the juveniles, and we didn't know that. And think, so we thought, right, let's find out where chicks go. Is that the answer? So we put these G GP solar satellite transmitters on the back of these chicks, and these are all chicks that are really close to fledging and in really, really good condition. And they only weigh eight and a half grams, these transmitters. So we had to adapt them slightly to put on aerodynamic nose cones and tape them on to their backs properly and add a base plate and things like that. But overall, uh, the, the weight is still under 3% of the bird's body weight, so it can take off all right. So we had 10 of these devices to put on, so put 10 on some really nice looking chicks. And this is what happened. All 10 technically left the colony, but only nine devices gave us any data. One bird only made it a few hundred kilometers from Ohino and then the transmitter stopped. But the rest all pretty much went north through the, through the Pacific. And they made that distance in about 10 days. So a fair motoring up to there. And then you can see that the tracks get a little squidgy and they sort of start for, that's obviously where they think, oh God, I'm really hungry and I need to start eating some food as well. But then we're not quite sure what happened. The devices all had good battery life. They should have all kept transmitting. And they've just gone into a region that has seriously high numbers of fishing like seriously high and it's highly likely that every single one of our eight chicks at that stage got caught on fishing lines. So we're talking with some others and Chris used this wonderful site has arrived just in time at a meeting and all the observer trainers there are going what do we have to look out for? If it comes up on our boat that's amazing we can give you devices back and various other things or, or if the bird's alive we can, we can do something with that. Of course, there is a slight possibility that the chicks learnt how to pull the devices off their back. Their parents are very good at that. But it did seem a little suspicious that they all made it that far without pulling them off before that. But it is something we have to look out for. And hopefully with these contacts and chatting with Chris, we might be able to get some of the devices or some information about what happens to birds with bands and tracks and tracking devices in that region because these boats have observers on board and we can we can get some of that information but it's a pretty exciting first step and we're hoping to do a lot more work with chicks and get some more information with that so yeah hopefully not a depressing note but uh, hopefully more things to, to get excited about in the future and you know we're like I said we are continuing to do lots of work on these species so we're going to this season do some simultaneous tracking of birds on Oihinau in the Mercury Islands and Lady Alice in the hen and chicken group to see if there's spatial time and spatial differences um, foraging range and location and things we're doing some the population estimates on those other two islands to compare with those earlier ones to see if the trend is the same on all of the islands in the Gulf we're also doing more population monitoring on black petrels and we're doing some really, really important population estimate work for uh, Great Barrier for those black petrels to, to make sure all our estimates so far uh, are right and looking at long-term tracking in those areas as well with work with Bayer and a few other, few other collaborators. But of course, like I said, we couldn't do this without a whole heap of help and we support you know for working on their islands and with their amazing species and things and lots and lots of field assistance in the, in the field so yeah thanks very much <laughs>